Hi, Kyler. Can you hear me okay? Hey, yeah, I can hear you. No, uh, so anyways, the I don't know if the connection will be super good. At at at, at some point, I, if if um, sometimes during when I teach, some of the students tell me that they can only hear like they I fade away once in a while, but I guess that's okay. I see. <laughs> okay, if that happens. I'll have to just like. Well, Give you a talk for you or something yeah yeah but i think it should be um if it gets really bad i'll switch over to my uh my uh cell data uh which sometimes actually works better so so far it's pretty good at least and i'm okay issues. right sounds good <sighs> so how are you doing ah not too bad how about you how's it are you um in california or yeah, yeah, it's stuck at home. It's not really that bad. Uh, but Mike, wait, Michael Hutchinson is, is in some sort of library. So. <laughs> I think you're muted. That, that's my Zoom background. That's not my actual home. Oh, oh. The, the funny thing is that uh, it, it makes your whole face look bigger because uh, there's like a white, like white rim around you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. You have some other backgrounds. Maybe I'll do. Uh, what up? Do you do you have a pretty powerful graphics processor? Because when I try virtual background on my computer, it always ends up a little bit has some defects. <laughs> it's not convincing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty new laptop. I, I I try not to do it. I think the last time I tried to do it, I. I think my background is not not so good, so it, it just uh, like half of me disappeared. <laughs> I think I, I I tried to do it at some point, and it it concealed just the wall, and then didn't conceal exactly the things that I wanted to conceal, like oh, the, okay. the junk in the background. So <laughs> those were still visible through the. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, it's the first time I you know the. I haven't actually attended any of the virtual symplectic seminars because uh, I usually have to take care of my kids in the morning. Uh, <laughs> I see you haven't convinced them that so, uh, they should. Yeah. So so uh, how, some... yeah. So so how how do these things work? The you there there's a what's it there's a oh okay. <laughs> okay so uh, yeah it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kohanda from UCLA and. And he's going to tell us about uh, convex hypersurface theory in higher dimensions. Uh, and maybe let me just make a quick announcement. So um, on the seminar website, we have a, a survey. So if, if anyone wants to suggest uh, future speakers, um, please feel free to do so. We, we especially encourage um, recent or soon to be PhD students. So take it away. OK. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for the invitation. and. Uh, um, I hope everyone's doing as well as they can under the circumstances. Okay, um, so I'd like to talk about convex hypersurface theory and high dimension, higher dimensional contact topology. Um, I've been talking about this for about a year now. Um, this is joint work with Yang Huang. Uh, let me just circle his name. Oops. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, hire him if you can, this uh, coming uh, season. OK, so the goal of today's talk is uh, as follows. Um, oh, chat. Leaks? Oh, oh, sorry. OK, I, I just looked at the chat. Maybe I shouldn't. Uh, Given a closed co-oriented contact manifold MC of dimension two n plus one, uh, so namely C is the kernel of a global one form alpha, such that alpha wedge d alpha, d alpha to the power n is a positive multiple of positive, positive function times a volume form. You want to cut it up along a closed oriented hypersurface uh, sigma two n in order to analyze it. Um, so today, I think uh, I'm going to try to stay stick to the the the, the numbers. So um, it's going to be the contact manifolds will be dimension two n plus one, 
And uh, the hypersurfaces uh, will be dimension 2n, will be dimension 2n. Okay. So hopefully I can keep it that way. Um, in the case of th contact three manifolds, uh, convex, convex surface theory has been very useful for decomposing, analyzing, and classifying tight contact structures. Um, and the question is really, what can you do in higher dimensions? Um, you can do a bit, but I think the, the upshot for today is that you can do a bit, but then there's still a lot more to do. Okay. So um, for a little bit, I'll do some symplectic preliminaries. Um, and you can, you know, if, I think there's been a lot of talks on this kind of stuff. So if you're familiar with this, please, you can feel, feel free to, uh, I don't know, zone out for a little bit. Um, a pair uh, consisting of a compact manifold W of dimension 2n uh, with boundary and a primitive lambda of a symplectic form on W is said to be a alluvial domain if the vector field defined in this way, uh, the x contracted into d lambda is equal to lambda. Uh, it's called the alluvial vector field, points out of the boundary of W, right? And uh, in general, the alluvial vector field can have pretty complicated dynamics. So I'm not sure what, what, what I would want to draw. So I suppose you have something like this. And uh, you know, the legal vector field points out of the boundary. So this is W, 2n, and x points out. And uh, in, in general, the, the dynamics could be super complicated. It could, you know, so there's all sorts of things. It could have orbits, you could have, uh, you know, things that are coming back and, and being sort of chaotic looking. And uh, on the other hand, uh, a, a particularly nice class of uh, Liouville domains is called Weinstein. If the Liouville vector field X is gradient-like with respect to some Morse function F from W to R. And in particular, it has isolated Morse type singularities, X equals zero. Uh, we also know that note that the boundary of W, uh, and if you sort of is contact, if you restrict the one form to the boundary. Okay. And uh, I won't say much more about this, uh, but you know, this one of the important questions uh, that people really don't understand very much is this uh, distinction between Lilville and Weinstein, right? So somehow, what's the borderline between Lilville and Weinstein? How can you get from one to the other? I guess, how can you get from this to that? Wait, I think I had something. No, 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 not yet. Okay. Uh, so uh, a closed oriented embedded hypersurface sigma of dimension 2n is uh, said to be convex if there exists a contact vector field V, which is transverse to sigma. So this is a little bit funny because um, convex is the same as concave in contact geometry. So you have a you know, hypersurface and you have a contact vector field V, which is transverse to the sigma. And uh, well, <laughs> it turns out that v minus V is also a contact vector field. So there's really no difference between convex and concave. We'll just call it convex. Um, and uh, one of the funny things is that um, the if you have a convex hypersurface, its dividing set, you have a invariant called its dividing set, uh, it's given by the set of points on sigma such that V of x is in C, right? So uh, the picture now is, I'm not sure if I should, yeah, you have a, surface or hypersurface. And then your contact structure, you know, you can sort of imagine the contact structure sort of wobbling around on, on this hypersurface. And at certain places, it's going to be perpendicular to the hypersurface. So uh, I'm sorry, it's, it, yeah. And then, so the, if you think in terms, perpendicular means in terms of uh, the contact vector field V. So if the contact vector field, which is like this, and it lies in the, con in the contact structure, then it, it belongs to the dividing set. Um, the strange thing is this dividing set 
has some nice properties in spite of like what it looks like. Um, it is actually a submanifold. Okay. So one can show that gamma is a, a contact submanifold of dimension 2n minus 1. Uh, and up to isotopy, gamma is independent of the choice of contact vector field B. So you, you can take a cut, there's a contact isotopy of contact, contact submanifolds from one to the other. Uh, gamma divides sigma into alternating positive and negative regions, R plus of gamma and R minus of gamma, which are Liouville with respect to uh, uh, alpha restricted to R plus minus of gamma, where alpha is a contact form for C. Okay. Uh, right, and um, one sort of special definition I need to make today is that a convex hypersurface sigma is said to be Weinstein convex. I think that's how you're supposed to say it. Weinstein convex if R plus minus gamma R Weinstein. So, um, you know, you can sort of get hypersurface, convex hypersurfaces that, that could comprise of things that are Liouville, but those are the things that are um, somehow excluded for today. Okay, for today, we assume like somehow all convex hypersurfaces are have Weinstein uh, R plus minus. Okay. All right, and uh, the other thing you need to know are is the characteristic foliation. So the characteristic foliation denoted sigma sub C is a singular line field in C intersect T sigma such that that thing holds. Um, so let me explain a little bit. Um, Sigma has, I'm sorry, sigma has dimension 2n. So at a point, this is dimension, uh, at a point, uh, t sigma has dimension 2n, c has dimension 2n, as or rank or whatever at a point. And generically, their intersection is 2n minus 1 dimensional. So hold on. Right, generically, it's 2n minus 1 dimensional. And you're interested in d alpha on this 2n minus one dimensional plane. Um, well, if you think about it, d alpha is trying to be as symplectic as possible. So um, it has maximum rank and there's one direction, which is, uh, well, the, the, the kernel. So the kernel of this d alpha restricted to c minus t sigma is the characteristic foliation. So this is the characteristic direction. And uh, if d alpha have, yeah, so, that's that. And uh, if dimension of M is three, uh, well, sigma intersect T sigma is generically one dimensional. So there's really no symplectic condition that you need to impose. So uh, the characteristic foliation in dimension three is simply uh, C intersect T sigma. Okay. And uh, there's one more thing you probably need to know. Uh, and that's that the Liouville vector fields of R plus minus of gamma are then going to be tangent to uh, sigma sub c, okay, tangent to the characteristic foliation. Okay. Uh, are there any questions so far? Okay, so in dimension three, the following are known. Uh, the first thing is that a C infinity generic surface sigma is convex. Uh, second thing is that the neighborhood of a convex surface sigma, so if you have a convex surface sigma, then you're sort of interested in the neighborhood of this. And the neighborhood, um, is, or a sufficiently small neighborhood, is completely determined by the oriented embedded one manifold sigma. Sigma is now in uh, one manifold, and uh, it's, Sigma is completely determined by sort of basically a collection of, of curves on the surface. And manipulating convex surfaces reduces to manipulating uh, curves on surfaces. The next thing is that if you have a C, okay, so this is a little bit, uh, a little bit weird, but a C zero generic one parameter family sigma cross zero one embedded into M is convex except at finitely many times Ti uh, and the dividing set changes by an operation called the bypass attachment as we cross TI. Okay. So suppose you, now you have like a family of, uh, of uh, embedded surfaces, and then you sort of try to sweep out, you know, part of the manifold with this. And uh, 
what you find is that um, at most times it's going to be convex and at certain sort of finite like fixed times you're going to have some sort of bifurcation in uh, in this com dividing set and the bifurcation uh, oh so the in this pic in this picture below the red is the dividing set right so the so the red is the dividing set and the, the dividing set changes sort of as prescribed. And this is a local picture. So you suppose you pick, you find some arc and you know, and it locally, and you sort of have a small neighborhood of the arc, which intersect the dividing set three times, and you do this operation and it's called the bypass. Um, uh, generally, you don't, uh, a priori for the most part, you really don't know what bypass operation you're gonna be doing. You know there's something and then usually the kind of uh, Zen of this kind of thing is that you look at what happens on sigma cross zero, what's on sigma cross one, and try to figure out how to get from one to the other. And usually there's only like a finite number of choices you have. Okay, so uh, what happens in higher dimensions? Uh, the, I guess I'll label the theorems, theorem A, B, and maybe there's another one called C. Uh, Theorem A says any closed hypersurface in a contact manifold can be C0 approximated by a Weinstein convex wall. Okay. So uh, C0 convex means uh, given a sort of hypersurface, oops, given a hypersurface, right? You can, you're allowed to do some relatively drastic things as long as it's not so, you know, uh, you can do stuff like this and that's perfectly fine. And in fact, what will end up happening is that schematically, oops, you're gonna be making modifications like these. Okay, and then uh, theorem B, uh, says the following, suppose you have a contact structure on sigma cross zero one, uh, such that the hypersurfaces sigma cross zero and sigma cross one are Weinstein convex, then uh, up to a boundary relative contact isotopy. So I think you don't, you don't wanna do anything about the boundary, right? You just wanna keep the contact structure the same. And, uh, and you can either isotope the surfaces or you can isotope C. I don't know which I did here. Uh, uh, I guess I'm isotoping C, right? Then there exists a finite sequence, uh, so T1 through Tn, such that the following hold. Uh, you know that sigma cross T is Weinstein convex uh, for all T not equal to Ti. Okay? And for each, each I, there exists a small sort of uh, small neighborhood such that C restricted to this uh, neighborhood is contactomorphic to a bypass attachment. So um, at least in practice, I, it's sort of hard to tell what happens, but at least in, in theory, you can actually sort of break up any sigma cross zero one into just sort of, you know, nothing happens for a while and then a bifurcation happens and nothing happens for a while and then a bifurcation happens and so on. Okay, so that's theorem B. Um, and maybe I'll say a little bit about what's a bypass in higher dimensions. I'm not sure uh, if you already don't know what it is, you may not get, you may not understand anything, but that's, uh, I should probably say something. So a bypass along a convex hypersurface. Oh, there's some, maybe there's a question. Can that be described by handle attachments? Yes. So, oh, the, this, the description for the bypass attachment is actually a handle attachment. Um, so a bypass along a convex hypersurface, uh, the, this is just a generalization of the three-dimensional one, is given by attaching a topologically canceling pair, or maybe smoothly canceling pair of middle dimensional, so that's n and m plus one dimensional handles, and consists of some data, uh, d plus, d minus, uh, I guess in some sense, d plus, d minus are the only thing you really need. And, but I just wanted to emphasize that d and d minus have Legendrian boundary, and the Legendrian boundary is lambda plus and lambda minus. So uh, d plus, okay, so 
Oh, is there some other question? In the existence of convex hypersurfaces, do you have any control over the smooth topology of the two Weinstein halves of the convex hypersurface? Do I know what they look like? Uh, in theory, no. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, maybe the thing is, in practice, I have no idea what they look like. Um, even for things like, you know, suppose I have a uh, S, yeah, so suppose I have a sphere, let's say S5, and I, you know, picked this, you know, uh, what is it, S4 inside, right? So the trivial S4 inside, and I tried to sort of move this around, you know, the, the, the five manifold S, then I really have no idea what happens. Um, this is sort of the next frontier. Um, these are sort of like explicit questions about what you can do to, with convex hypersurfaces. And uh, there's a whole range of things you can do. And I don't know. I don't really know how to enumerate you know, all possibilities and so on. This, um, for the moment, I think this technology, this is sort of, I think that's sort of one level higher than what we can do at this moment. The, sort of the things that are sort of more reasonable or more theoretical things, like existence of open books and so on. Okay, I'm not sure what uh, Selman's question was, so, but let me just keep on going. And then if Selman has, still has questions, you, uh, you can ask. Um, okay, so this region is R plus, this region is R minus. And uh, there's a Lagrangian disk inside R plus with Legendrian boundary. Oh, oh, maybe with cylindrical Legend, like cylindrical ends, uh, limiting to a uh, Legendrian. Okay. And so the boundaries are. Right, this is lambda plus, and this is lambda minus. This is sort. Of, oops, that's, that looks like an A. Um, it, it's actually sort of funny because uh, in dimension three it looks like the boundary is disconnected, which is only special, this is special to dimension three. Um, so, okay, so you have the disk and you have lambda plus and lambda minus. Uh, and we're assuming that there's a short rave chord from lambda plus to lambda minus. So this is, uh, this is a, a dividing set. And inside the, like, let's now sort of draw what's happening inside the dividing set. Inside the dividing set, there's, uh, let's pretend there's like lambda minus and there's lambda plus. Oh, sorry. Let me uh, let me disable uh, something. Uh, sorry. Let me let me disable the touch screen. Okay. And uh, I'm assuming that there's some sort of short rain chord C. Okay. And uh, th this is roughly the data that you have. And uh, the N handle, you're attaching an N handle and the canceling N minus one handle, I'm sorry, N plus one handle. And the N handle is attached along this thing. It's some sort of uh, uh, Legendrian, sorry, Le Legendrian sum of the two things. And one of the things is that I can't remember which, I, I never remember which one's which. Uh, so if you look from 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 above, there's a lambda plus, or sorry, there's a lambda minus, and there's a lambda plus, and it's resolved in one of the two ways, and I can't, <laughs> I can never remember. Uh, I think, but let's just decide like for the time being, it's resolved like this. It's lambda minus. So there, there's some sort of you know particular way of resolving, and I can't remember. Uh, okay, and so the n handle, oh, so in this particular in this dimension, that sort of means that these things are like these two intersection points cancel, and then there's one here, and there's like another point here, and the n minus one handle, this like in this case a one handle is attached along these two orange things. along these two orange things. And then uh, once you attach the n handle, there's like a cat, there's an n minus, n plus one handle that you attach. Uh, 
uh, I'm, I guess it, sort of schematically, you, if you attach the end handle, there's another thing that's sort of waiting, which is, looks like that, right? And you attach your next handle there. Okay. And um, if you sort of, uh, it, it, the following description of what the, the R plus and R minus are is not really obvious, but um, the new R plus after doing this bypass attachment is obtained by removing D plus, a neighborhood of D plus, and attaching an N handle along uh, lambda minus uh, some lambda plus. And then the R minus is obtained by removing the neighborhood of the D minus and attaching the handle. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure if it helps at all, but uh, that's the description. All right, uh, so let's get started on the proof. Oh, uh, and uh, if if Selman still has a question, I'll, I'll you can ask again. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, step zero. So we'll give a sketch of proof of theorem A, and then uh, what are some words about B. Um, the first thing is to note that the singular points of sigma, uh, of sigma sub c, occur when t of sigma T sigma is is plus or minus C. So so that you have the hypersurface and you have a contact structure. They're sort of like wobbling. Like guess the contact structure is sort of wobbling around as you go around. And you're interested in places where they're the same, okay? where they agree. So uh, where they agree, they're sort of it's either the orientations either agree or they're sort of the opposite. And uh, depending on the sign, you either say it's positive or negative. Uh, and a C infinity generic hypersurface, th this one's sort of for free. A C infinity generic hypersurface can be made to have um, isolated Morse type singular points, um, where the singular set of singular points might actually be empty. That's sort of okay for the, for the time being. And um, it, but it do actually doesn't say anything about how complicated the, the dynamics is. You, you know, at least. At the, near the, the singularities can actually be made simple. And um, after a choice of orientation of a vector field directing the characteristic foliation, uh, the positive singularities have indices one through zero through n, and the negative singularities have indices n to two n. And uh, basically, this is um, roughly the same kind of index calculation that says if you have a Weinstein domain or something, then of, of dimension. 2n, then all the singular points have index of most n. It's basically the same calculation. Okay. And uh, there's like two, two definitions, one sort of obvious, and then the other, which is sort of crucial, but maybe less obvious. So we say a hypersurface sigma is Morse if the characteristic foliation is gradient-like with respect to some Morse function on sigma. I think that's pretty uh, straightforward. Um, we say that it's Morse plus. If in addition, there are no trajectories of uh, the characteristic foliation from a negative singular point to a positive one. So remember that negative ones have higher index. And oh, by the way, the gradient trajectories are, uh, I guess, positive gradient trajectories. So. Uh, the kind of funny thing that could happen that that you would you don't really like is that if you have index n, it's a negative singular point. If you have index n, it's a positive singular point. And uh, you you don't want trajectories, Morse trajectories, from a negative singular point to a positive singular point. Okay. Um, and you might ask, well, generically this doesn't happen, right? <laughs> so generically uh, everything is Morse plus. But then if you think a little bit, um, it, it'll turn out that we care about things with uh, one par parametric versions of these things. And in this one parametric version, this could actually help. You could have a, you know, a, a trajectory from a negative index n negative singular point to an index n positive singular point. And um, the, these are somehow the, the key places where convexity is broken and you have some sort of bifurcation. So, so everything else is okay. It, I guess even in one parameter families, 
uh, everything else is okay. So generally you have a collection of positive critical points and you have you know, a collection of negative critical points and it's sort of more or less self-indexing. So greater than or equal to n and this is less than or equal to n. Okay, and uh, the following is a Morse, what is it? Morse vector field detection lemma. It's relatively straightforward. Um, a smooth vector field B on a closed manifold M is said to be Morse, uh, is, is, is Morse, if and only if the following hold. Uh, the first is sort of completely, like you really need it, right? V, v is Morse on, a, on small neighborhoods of its zeros. Um, the second condition is that for any element in M where V of X is non-zero, so for, if you had a place X um, in the manifold where the you know, vector field is non-zero, you the for, the flow line of V passing through X, this is the like you keep on going, right? Uh, eventually limits to a zero of V in forward time. Okay, or and also in backward time. So if you sort of go back, eventually you end up at a zero. So you really need this condition. Um, and the third condition, it, you might think this is all the conditions you need, but if you think a little bit more, there's one more, that there's no closed cycles. Uh, right, something like this. So you, you start with x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on. And you sort of go around and eventually come back to your, like itself. So as long as this doesn't happen, um, then you know that your vector field is Morse. So that's a pretty good way of, uh, it's sort of dynamical way of detecting when a vector field can be made Morse. Okay, so uh, I think that's the preliminaries. Oh yeah, and uh, the relatively easy, easy fact is that any Morse plus hypersurface is Weinstein convex. So if you have, so, so we call Morse plus means it's Morse. And uh, in addition, there are no trajectories from a negative singular point to a positive one. So if you have this, uh, then it's Weinstein convex. And the proof is similar to Giroux's proof uh, of, for convex surfaces in dimension three. So I won't say too much more about this. Okay, uh, by the way, are there any questions so far? Uh, okay, so uh, let's do, uh, I'll explain the basic idea at dimension three and uh, mutter some more words about how you do this in higher dimensions. Okay, so uh, the proof in dimension three actually is a new proof of the C0 generosity of convex surfaces. Um, and it's amenable to higher dimensional generalization. So um, the thing it's sort of, okay, so the thing I told you earlier is that it's true that a C infinity generic convex uh, surface is su surface in a three, three contact three manifold is convex. Um, uh, I actually don't know what, how, whether it's true in higher dimensions, but if you think a little bit, so, so I think in hindsight, it turns out that C infinity generic is really not so good. So C, if we talk about C infinity perturbations of dynamical systems and so on, you sort of like, you know, en end up having to do dynamics and not Morse theory. And uh, what, what's happening here is that we're gonna be doing Morse theory instead of, if you do C zero generosity, then we're end up, we will end up doing sort of Morse theory, which is much easier. Okay. Anyway, so con consider the contact form dz plus e to the s dt on R3 with coordinates s t z. It's slightly unusual, but uh, much more useful. And uh, consider the surface uh, sigma, which is z equals zero. Okay, so uh, I think, uh, yeah, so maybe I, I'll, I'll have a picture on the next slide, but uh, this is sigma. Uh, and I think S is this direction, T is this direction, and Z is out of the, whatever it's called, out of your screen. And um, the characteristic foliation you can calculate is DDS. 
And uh, you'd like to sort of perturb this so it actually has, you know, basically you want to put in uh, what's, what's called a plug in dynamical systems parlance. You want to put in some sort of something that looks like a plug, which basically blocks all flows. Okay, so the first attempt would be to use this thing called the Jiru elimination lemma, or maybe the Jiru creation lemma, um, to create a pair consisting of an index zero and index one singular point. So, like, you know, so you have your characteristic foliation and you want to see, you know, you want to do something, you know, do some modification. So you create, you know, a pair of uh, singular points. Um, but unfortunately, this kind of thing has the defect of changing the dynamics in pretty uncontrollable ways, right? So if you sort of look a little bit, you have your, it starts here and sort of goes off to the, and there's like a little bit of room to sort of maneuver to the side. And if you like, yeah, so it just sort of makes things a little bit, uh, you know, small perturbations can make pretty, have, can have pretty large, uh, you know, behavioral change when you're talking about dynamical systems. Um, so instead, what we do is the following. You want to create, simultaneously create four critical points, one index zero and two index one and one index two. So like there's sort of four critical points here. Okay. Um, such that anything that's flowing in, if you sort of look over here, either gets trapped into this singular point, it either ends up here or if you're sort of on the side, like, so if you pass through, then if you sort of like, okay, so it sort of bends a little bit, but if you think a little bit, the place where you start and place where you end is that hasn't really been affected. So if you think in terms of holonomy or monodromy, right, where you start and where you end really hasn't changed compared to like previously. So something like this is usually called a plug. You're just, you're just putting in something along the way such that um, everything sort of just keeps on going, either keeps on going in the same way it was before, or it just sort of ends up in this, in this plug. Okay. And uh, the, this can actually be geometrically, so okay, so far this is just drawing some pictures. And uh, this, can, this can be geometrically done using uh, a mushroom, uh, technical term for this, in our paper is C fold. I really don't like this C fold terminology, but uh, um, well, the the reason it stayed this way is that if you changed all this, you know, if you searched and replaced, then C fold turning into mushroom makes the paper longer. So um, that's why it wasn't done this way. And um, the also the other thing that's a little bit unfortunate is that. In this day and age, what, what you want to do is like put in a lot of mushrooms. Okay, so eventually you sort of want to put in lots and lots of mushrooms like this all over the place. Okay, and unfortunately in this day and age, this starts looking like the coronavirus. So it's a little bit unfortunate. Anyways, um, so we consider the contact structure as before, um, where the, fr like basically the important thing is that the base of this mushroom is smaller than the, the somehow the width, the head of the mushroom. Okay. And uh, one thing that you, you probably need to compute for yourself is that the contact structure as you're going in the positive s direction starts, okay, maybe I'll like starts rotating like as you go in the positive x direction it does this. Okay. So in the front face the slope is smaller than or sorry, slope as seen like this. Like if you if okay it's actually not the, the, the slight problem is that the t direction is going the other way, but let's pretend, you know, or this is positive slope and has like more positive slope. So you start with positive slope and it becomes even more like the slope will be even more positive as you go towards the back, right? Meaning like go in, go in the positive s direction. Okay. And um, uh, the comment on the bottom is that the other faces of, of this uh, C fold the top face still has characteristic foliation DDS, and then the side faces also have characteristic foliation DDS. Okay. So everything on the sides have DDS, characteristic foliation DDS, and the top has a certain, so the, the front face has a certain slope, and then the back face has a like, slope a little bit more uh, tilted. And uh, if you look at the dynamics, um, 
And if the base of the mushroom is sufficiently small compared to the rest, <coughs> then you sort of follow the, you know, follow the trajectory. So you go, you know, go front, right, go, and then you just go straight to the back. And the, the important thing is that the front face is sloped less than the back face. So if you, or so maybe I'll just change the, let me view this. Okay, so the front face is uh, different from the back face. Uh, so if you go up and then over and come back, you'll, maybe it's sort of hard to tell, but you end up going up and then down and back, up, uh, the, the, and so on. And then you sort of eventually converge to the side edge. Okay. That's somehow the most important feature. So anything that sort of passes to the front, sort of passes to the front, eventually sort of gets trapped by the side edge. And the same thing if you do backward flow coming in from the back. So, and then everything else on the side over here just passes straight through. And if you sort of have something like this, it passes straight through. Okay. So somehow you're, you know, everything eventually gets trapped. So basically this, this three-dimensional mushroom look, behaves like a sink. Okay, let me change this. Okay, and uh, quantitatively, it turns out that in order for this to behave like a sink, the width of the mushroom <coughs> has to be slightly more than twice the width of the base. So what, what I mean by this is the following. So you have, if you have a um, uh, side view of this, okay, it has to look like this. So this is, let me just draw. Okay. This is the width of the base and the width of the mushroom is this. Okay. And so, in order for this like trapping behavior to happen, the this has the top has to be twice as at least twice as uh, long, wide as the the thing on the bottom. Okay. And so, what I'd like to, what we'd like to do is like pack as many as possible. Right? If you try to pack as many as possible, then you know your the thing that's sort of blocking you is somehow the face, the shape of the top. So um, what you can do is actually, this is actually some sort of strange, like weakly quantitative problem. So suppose I want to block, you know, I had some sort of characteristic foliation that goes through and I want to <laughs> block everything, right? <laughs> then I need three rows of mushrooms because I can only trap a third of it at a time. So I need, okay, so the first row, right, captures a third. The second cap, like so, and then there's like about two thirds left, and then second row captures, you know, another third, and then the third row captures what's left. So quantitatively, uh, you can't really dispense with just one row of mushrooms or two rows of mushrooms. You actually need three rows in order to sort of capture everything that's sort of missed. Uh, the other thing is that uh, it's, it's only the ratio of like the, the what is it called, the, the width to the length of the base that matters. So you can actually make this arbitrarily small. So let me draw. So instead of this, I could make this like arbitrarily small. Okay. And so on. And as long as the ratios are, are preserved, it doesn't really matter. Okay, uh, are there any questions about this, the three-dimensional mushroom? <laughs> okay, um, so anyways, this, this can be actually done in, in as many parameters as you want. And so uh, in three dimensions, just inserting this you, like basically immediately gives you something as convex and any one parameter family of like, you know, com things uh, one, one, one parameter foliation of surfaces can be made convex except for a finite number of places. Okay, so what about mushrooms in higher dimensions? Um, the one thing that I forgot to sort of uh, mention 
is that if you have uh, allele, I'm sorry, uh, characteristic foliation, um, I'd like to do put in some sort of uh, something that looks like a plug. And the first thing you need to know is that any transverse slice, if you have something that's transverse, so this is inside, uh, okay. this is inside a two n dimensional uh, sur uh, in the high com hypersurface. And so this thing actually has dimension, uh, what is it, y, 2n, minus 1. Okay. And anything that's transverse to the characteristic foliation is actually contact. Okay. So this you sort of need to know. So these like transverse things are contact. And inside this con these contact manifolds, I'd like to sort of uh, right, like figure out some domains inside of this. So, so maybe I should have drawn something a little bit more, sorry, a little bit more three-dimensional. Um, so I have, suppose this is the transfer slice. Uh, it's, it's more of a three-dimensional picture. And inside here, there's some sort of domain, right? And I want to use this as some sort of, you know, like I want to, you know, pick a bunch of domains and then somehow use it to block things. And the most prototypical thing that you want to use is called a contact handle body. Okay. Um, so the contact handle body is now a, this, this is supposed to be 2n minus one dimensional. Okay. And it's of the form uh, interval times w, where w is a Weinstein domain, Weinstein domain of dimension 2n minus two. So somehow there's like too many dimensions to keep track of. And if, you've, uh, if you're sort of new to this kind of thing, you might be sort of confused. But uh, this is dimension, y has dimension 2n minus one, h has dimension 2n minus one, this is two, sorry, 2n minus two, this is one dimension. Okay. So you have a Weinstein domain cross with a con like basically a dt direction. Okay. So this is called the contact handle body. And, and uh, what you can do, like, you'll have to start trusting me on this at this point. You can start constructing mushrooms that look like three-dimensional mushrooms cross with W with some damping out near the boundary. So you, you have this W and there's some sort of three-dimensional model and you want to make some sort of hybrid of the two, the two things. Uh, and the three-dimensional model only has this piece, right? It has a DT and you want to do something to it. And then there's also a lambda portion uh, so we have to do worry a little bit about damping out stuff near the boundary. Okay. So the schematic of what happens when you do what happens to dynamics is the following. So we have uh, let's suppose this direction is W, this direction is T, it's T, okay. um, and uh, suppose I have some sort of flow that's trying to go through, then. What happens is that anything that sort of and you know goes into the interior of this region gets trapped, and then oh, there's one more thing. Let me I need to write something. Uh, let's say this is r minus and this side is r plus. Okay, so this is also convex. The boundary is convex hypersurface. This is r minus and r plus, and what's happening to the flow? is that everything that sort of goes in the interior gets trapped. Everything else actually follows the flow of this characteristic foliation and goes around the boundary. So on, on the boundary of W, there's actually some sort of complication where things <coughs> go from, follow the characteristic foliation and go from R minus to R plus. And there's a little bit of spiraling that goes on near gamma as well. There's a little bit of complication near here, but uh, we'll ignore it for a second. Okay. So uh, that's what it says here. The modified characteristic foliation pushes points in, um, <clears throat> okay, boundary of H or sort of a small neighborhood of it around the boundary from R plus, plus to R minus. So there's some sort of strange dynamics going on. Okay. And we have to deal with it. And the, at this point, um, we, okay, so it turns out that we prove our main theorems by induction. And uh, it's actually more convenient to prove a host of other statements 
uh, before in dimension 2n minus 1 before going up to dimension 2n plus 1. So, so you, have to, you have to prove like three theorems on, in dimension 2n minus 1 before going up. And uh, okay, the, so we have to prove, okay, these two things. Uh, any closed contact manifold admits a compatible open book decomposition with Weinstein pages, pardon me, all Weinstein pages. Any, and then also any compact contact manifold with Weinstein convex boundary. If, if you have a contact manifold convex boundary uh, and you know, boundaries Weinstein, it admits a compatible partial open book decomposition, some sort of generalization of an open book decomposition with Weinstein pages. So we need to prove these two things before actually going up to the next level. So the first statement was proved by Giroux uh, using Donaldson's approximately holomorphic technology and the work of uh, Igor Martinez Torres and Presas. Um, and interestingly enough, at the moment, the second statement cannot be proved using this Donaldson technology. As far as I know, uh, I've asked some people uh, and people, if you can actually do this using Donaldson technology, please let me know. Uh, but uh, people tell me that uh, you actually can't do two with a, with a Donaldson technology. And we actually need two to go up to the next level. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to do is explain uh, how to complete the proof of A um, as follows. So suppose you have a contact, so, so we, remember we had this, you know, characteristic foliation and you had some sort of transfer slice, right? And uh, let's assume for the time being this transfer slice that we called Y is actually a closed contact manifold of dimension 2n minus 1. Okay, let's suppose it's closed for the time being, right? So we can actually, so in this case, we assume we, we use the open book decomposition provided. So this is, this is dimension 2n minus 1. So we assume that it actually has an open book decomposition of Weinstein pages, uh, right? Because we actually proved all of this up to dimension 2n minus 1. Anyways, by the inductive assumption, you can assume that, oh, so, so, okay, so maybe what's written here, uh, I'm sort of jumping the gun. By the inductive assumption, you may assume that boundary of Y is convex after a C0 small approximation and that Y can be given the structure of a partial open book decomposition. And then <clears throat> in the next step, I'm gonna assume <coughs> Y is actually a full open book, okay? So suppose you have a genuine open book decomposition, then Y can be sliced into thin, okay, so this is the S, like the vertical axis is the S direction. And um, the open book schematically has picture like, like this. Okay. Okay. And then the theta direction is this direction. And uh, you, okay, you have, to, you have to believe me that these little sectors, you know, of the open book decomposition. So you have a sector, right? That's a contact handle body. And so you line up the contact handle bodies. Um, you might actually have to do some sort of a uh, um, subdivision operation, <clears throat> but you have a bunch of handle bodies. In this case, you have six contact handle bodies. And uh, let's remember, recall what the, what the dynamics was doing. Oops. The dynamics is doing the following thing. So the, the, the flow is coming in from the bottom. So you have some flow coming in from the bottom. And uh, if it sort of, you know, enters this handle body, like most of this, then it gets sucked in. So you're happy. But then suppose it's sort of on the boundary. It sort of goes around this. Okay. Um, the thing is that you you overlap the the sectors, so the sectors are constructed so that they're overlapping like this. So if you have flow that sort of goes maybe goes over here, and somehow it doesn't get captured, it'll travel up. Okay. But then you've sort of arranged it so that the next one is sort of just you know waiting waiting to eat whatever is left, like so whatever escaped. So so basically it gets eaten 
unless, so, so everything gets eaten unless you have the following thing. You either sort of had, well, you're here, and then you went up, or you went up to blue and then followed along here and went up to green and follow along here, da -da, and up, right? And then what you do is you provide like a big, you know, big keyhole looking thing that's waiting to eat, right? So, but what I'm saying is the following. So you, you have something like this and all the things that don't get eaten sort of lie around here. And then you sort of wait around, wait, and you know, with something that's sort of like with its jaws open to sort of eat everything that sort of survived. So basically this is some sort of schematic for <coughs> um, constructing and yeah, it, uh, basically how, how do you, the, the schematic for how you break the Morse trajectory by, 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 by how do you break the trajectory by putting in a, something that looks like a plug. So every trajectory that goes through the bottom eventually gets eaten. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so I have uh, maybe two more slides. Um, the, there's some applications of this technology. Uh, one is that any almost contact submanifold can be C0 approximated by genuine contact submanifold. So this this is valid. I mean, people knew this uh, for everything except co-dimension two contact submanifolds. And another sort of amusing thing is that a contact submanifold can be C0 approximated by another contact submanifold with the opposite orientation. Um, so I guess in, in case uh, somehow <coughs> we have sort of three dimensional people, um, maybe I should say one thing that in three dimensions, you're interested in uh, Legendrian knots and transverse knots. Okay, so Legendrian knots and transverse knots and contact manifold. The strange thing is that in dimension three, uh, <laughs> they have the same dimension, but uh, in higher dimensions, the generalization of Legendrian is Legendrian, and uh, in higher dimensions, the generalization of transverse is co-dimension to contact submanifold. So co-dimension contact. Okay. Yeah, so somehow in, in, in dimension three, they seem to have <coughs> the same dimension, but in, in general, uh, yeah, they're, they're quite different. And uh, the, the, you know, in dimension three, these things are sort of well understood, but in higher dimensions, this may be a somewhat well understood, right? There's, I mean, there, there are invariants and so on. This one's maybe still like wide open as to like what you can do. And uh, okay, so let me just read this. Oh, in view of Gromov's H principle, the case that was previously unknown was the case of co-dimension two contact submanifolds. And also an alternate proof of this fact was given by Casals Pressas, uh, Casals Pancholi Pressas. Now, um, maybe I should say what mildly amusing thing is that um, this, the existence of, oh, sorry, uh, <coughs> this existence H principle for um, contact submanifolds of co-dimension two actually is sort of, uh, is actually sort of powerful. So uh, you can sort of immediately deduce the existence H principle for contact structures and give an alternate proof of result of Borman, Eliasberg, Murphy as follows. So suppose you have some sort of closed symplectic manifold. <coughs> Dimension M21 plus one. Uh, you can easily stabilize it, right, by crossing with R, R2. Okay. So you sort of cross with R2. Okay. Um, if M is almost contact, then M cross R2 is almost contact. And you can put a contact structure. So Gromov, Gromov's H principle tells you you can actually put on a contact map. So put a contact, sorry, put on a contact structure, homotopic to the almost contact structure. And then now all you have to do is go look for uh, uh, contact style metaphor, which is uh, homotopic to the original. So you just like find something like this, and that one's contact. 
So this basically gives you some sort of, uh, immediately gives you an existence H principle for contact structures. Um, so I think that's it for today. Uh, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, are there any questions, audience? Can you repeat the last thing you said? It's the last? Yeah, you crossed. Oh, the, are you talking about this, the contact sub? Oh, how do you get a contact mm -hmm. manifold, right? So, uh, so Gromov's H principle tells you that you can find a contact structure on, uh, on this thing, right? And then uh, you can use the uh, H, so you can use the exist, sorry, existence H principle for contact submanifolds to construct to construct this thing, right, uh, which is contact, right, and basically has the same homotopy type as the, the thing you started out with. That, that you have to check, but it has the same homotopy type as the thing you started out with. But, where did oh, you but there's actually new, one thing we... Where did you use your new technology in here? After each finding point? the contact submanifold. We You didn't know how to use... No, oh, so there's, okay, maybe I should say one thing. There's you, you can, the new technology also allows you to find contact submanifolds. This was maybe not completely obvious, but um, maybe I should, yeah, maybe I should explain how you, how you sort of schematically construct contact submanifolds, right? Suppose, okay, so the idea is as follows. It's not written like this in the paper, but what's supposed to happen is roughly like this. So suppose I have, uh, a vector field, and uh, suppose I want to reverse the or this is sort of the model question is like suppose I have a transverse knot, right? And I want to reverse the orientation of the transverse knot. So in order to reverse the orientation, uh, what I do? Okay, I'm not sure if I can do it off the top of my head, but you, you construct right uh, something similar. Sort of curious, but. You can do, uh, okay, maybe you sort of construct, but basically you sort of construct something like a, um, uh, um, like mushrooms and so on. And the thing to notice is that if you went around this way, okay, then you're actually, it's sort of transverse the other way. So I have to draw some, Uh, did I get this right? No, 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 no. These, these, these arrows are going. Down. So this one is going in. This one is out like this, and transverse, maybe like this. So if you look a little bit around this thing, if you sort of basically, if you go past the singular point, you're actually sort of you became negatively transverse. Okay. And this is this is basically the procedure that you're using to reverse the um, to so, somehow you know gen generically you sort of expect if you have something that's a convex I'm sorry, if you have a a submanifold which is you know you want to be convex I'm sorry you want to be contact submanifold then there's some places that are sort of positive and certain places that are negative and what you want to do is push the negative parts to become positive looking. And in order to do this, you, you use some, you know, generalization of this kind of operation. If you, one of the strange things is that if you create some singular points and push it as this, like as I drew it, it actually becomes negatively transverse. So anyways, that's the trick. How many pages? Pardon? 
How many pages does it take to do this? To do the, yeah. this is sort of dependent on the rest of the paper, right? <laughs> so so the, the, pro the problem is that the, the, if you believe some parts of the paper, then it's not so, it's like only like three or four pages. If you don't believe the rest of the paper, then um, you're gonna have to read like 90 pages or something because all this is proved in like lower dimensions and then you bootstrap up to higher dimensions. And then, you know, you have to prove many theorems at once. Thank you. Uh, so there's, a, there's another question from Muhammad in the chat. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, if whether we expect any kind of rigidity for, in general, for convex hypersurfaces and whether you think that whether this construction should be thought of as producing something flexible in the style of you know, what happens for Legendrians. Mm. I have a feeling that, okay, so, yeah, so, so your question probably can be rephrased as something like this, right? How do you detect, so, 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 so you can detect which ones are have tight neighborhoods and which ones have over twisted neighborhoods. And if you have over twisted, like if you have a convex hypersurface and the neighborhood is like, you know, any sufficiently small neighborhood is over twisted, then it's sort of things sort of, you know, everything all hell breaks loose. So that's probably the kind of question that you have. And um, in general, it's sort of hard to tell. There's like in dimension three, there's a zero criterion for telling precisely when a hypersurface is uh, is uh, is over twisted. Um, in higher dimensions, there are some examples, but there's no systematic study of which ones are over twisted and which ones are not. So maybe, yeah, maybe that's the only thing I can say at this moment. I also and, partly and, had in had in mind this uh, re this reproof of the existence of contact structures. Yeah. Oh yeah. So this is actually this is really funny. I actually don't know. I mean, I mean. Right, so when you do this reproof, right? <laughs> we don't know how to prove that the thing we have is actually over twisted. So, so it's this picture, right? This thing here. And I, I, I don't know uh, how to prove this thing is over twisted. So that I think in some sense there's like more questions, like if this whole business raises more questions than I'm capable of answering. I have a question. I mean, yeah. To to what extent does this? Oh, oh wait. Uh, should I answer Oleg's question or should I answer yours? Oh, sure. <laughs> Why don't you start with Oleg's question? Okay. Do you know if the Weinstein halves are flexible? Uh, Weinstein. Yes. If that way, halves are flexible. Okay. Do you know if the Weinstein halves are flexible? Weinstein halves surfaces. Um. Not necessarily. It's um, sometimes you're just putting in a lot of mushrooms and you're really doing nothing except to just slightly change the, it, it, it changes the dynamics sort of drastically, but sometimes the convex stuff doesn't change any, in some sense it doesn't change <clears throat> any global contact topology. So suppose if I run this thing for, you know, if I have a surface in dimension two and I put in lots and lots of mushrooms, Oftentimes you, you do nothing in the end. You create a lot of singular points, but you do nothing. So I answer to all these questions. I don't really know. I don't really know. Um, it doesn't look like in general, you create things like Weinstein things that are flexible, right? By this procedure, but um, you could, and like if you, you could, if you're not careful. Oh, oh, Kyler, your question? Yeah, so I was just wondering, like, sort of to what extent does this make the Donaldson technology obsolete? Like, well, um, the, goal, the goal is to get rid of it, but I don't know. So, <laughs> like, is there, is there any um, hope of, of, of constructing, like, symplectic divisors um, uh, or, or, like, a Lefschetz vibration structure in Weinstein domains? Right? I don't know. I don't, I, at this moment, I don't know, but 
that would be so uh, yeah so currently we're working on the stabilization part of the open book uh, zero correspondence and um, that seems reasonable uh, it's yeah, it's still a work in progress um, but in, in but I think if you want to do something you know more serious like use Donaldson you know get rid of Donaldson technology um, a lot more work needs to be done okay so shield has a question <coughs> Uh, yeah, so my, my question, <laughs> yeah. maybe there's a specialization of Oleg's question, but like, you know, there are, you know, for many Lebel manifold, you can just yes. construct a convex yes. hypersurface in yes. a stabilization, yes. which is which is like the doubling of the Lebel manifold. So so yes. now we could apply your theorem and get a CU0 close Weinstein convex yeah. hypersurface. Yes. And and what does it have? To, I, I'm just, you know, so the original thing was convex I, too. I, I was wondering no. what it has to do so, with this one. So, so, so unfortunately, it actually doesn't tell you too much. So suppose I have this, like, you know, you have Leeville and Leeville, right? And you have this dividing set. What eventually ends up is that um, you sort of create a bunch of things that are positive and a bunch of things that are negative. And so you're going to have things that are sort of, you know, eating in, like, do you know what I'm saying? There's like, so it, it is true that it's, it's sort of weird that in a neighborhood of a Leeville, what is it? Leeville convex hypersurface, right? There's like a C0 close Weinstein convex hypersurface, right? But the, I, yeah, so I don't really know, like, because you sort of create some mushrooms and some critical points and it gets sent over this side and the other ones get sent over to this side and so on. So, ah, uh, yes. At this I point, so I don't, you, I mean, I don't know. <clears throat> that, that freedom to send things to the other side, I suppose is, uh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. But anyways, I think the thing is like, there are lots and lots of questions you can ask. And this is just like the tip of, like, you know, sort of the, the beginning of what you can do. I, it's, I, there's sort of many questions and I can't really answer almost any of them. Okay, so uh, let's maybe uh, thank Ko again and then I'll turn off the recording and then if anyone wants we can stick around more for informal discussion. So thanks again, Bizak. Thank you. Stay, stay safe.